Okay, I think it's time to start. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Jasper Kirby give us a talk on the cloud experiment. In fact, he's been trying to get this experiment approved for a number of years. It was indeed approved in 2006, and now they begin to have data. So uh, we're really great, really glad that he can actually finally fulfill his dreams. <laughs> I won't tell you his biography because he's been part of the local furniture for the last 25 years. <laughs> so yeah. if, you don't, if you don't know him by now, there's no <laughs> point in uh, giving you the biography. Yes. Okay, Lewis, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I, to give this talk uh, on cosmic rays and climate, and I have to say right at the outset that um, I'm not going to be providing answers in this talk. I'm going to be providing uh, questions and uncertainties and hopefully stimulate your interest in the subject, but uh, I certainly won't be providing answers because I don't know what the answers are myself. Okay, so let me first of all set the context for the talk by a couple of slides on present climate change. Now, the, the, uh, the, the current measurements of the global warming, oh, this is a very hard thing to use. Can I? Okay, I've been asked to use this pointer, but it's very, very tough. Um, okay, this is the uh, temperature record measured by surface thermometers over the last 100 years. And it's interesting to note that uh, it has a very distinctive feature, it rises up to about 1945, it flattens off or even goes down a little, and then it goes up very steeply in the last uh, 30 years or so. So that's a 0.7 or 0.8 degree C temperature rise, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has assessed all the contributions, the causes of this rise, uh, the so-called forcing mechanisms, and they're shown here. Um, with all due respect to the photographers, I've got to use the uh, media people. I've got to use this pointer. This thing is very sluggish. Um, okay, the total contribution that's estimated from mankind is shown here. It's 1.6 watts per square meter, and it's made up of all these contributions. The largest is the CO2 contribution, which itself is about 1.5 watts per square meter. There are other greenhouse gases, uh, but also mankind has thrown up aerosols over this period, and uh, that has a cooling effect uh, by its effect on clouds, but with large uncertainties. Anyway, the sum total of those is one and a half watts per square meter. Now, what's the, 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 the purpose of this talk is actually to focus on what should go in this, uh, this row here, which is the natural contribution. Now, the current understanding is that the only significant thing, apart from short-term changes due to volcanoes, the only natural contribution to climate change in the industrial period here is a slight change in the brightness of the sun that's a, a positive, it's increased in brightness, and this has contributed about 0.1 watts per square meter, which has contributed almost a negligible amount of this period, a few hundredths of a degree. So that's the, that's the current state of, uh, state of understanding. But it's recognized by the IPCC that clouds are very poorly understood. Uh, now, why are clouds important for climate change? Well, uh, clouds cover a large fraction of the globe. About two-thirds of the globe is covered with clouds averaged over the entire year. If you could wave a magic wand and suddenly remove all clouds from the ground, there would be an extra 30 watts per square meter of uh, perturbation, extra heat load on the ground. And that's to be compared with the one and a half watts per square meter uh, that's calculated for the anthropogenic contribution. So you can see instantly that a very small systematic change over the 20th century in clouds could have a very big uh, effect on our understanding of the contributions to the current warming. Now, just to give you a kind of uh, a visual impression as to what a difficult job this is from the point of view of computation, here are uh, a couple of satellite observations uh, it's going to be a movie I'll show you over the full year. Um, this is a measurement by the satellite of the reflected solar radiation. So you can see there are very large variations. There are parts that are reflecting a large amount. These are the tops of white clouds. And there are other parts that are absorbing essentially all the solar radiation reaching the Earth. Averaged over the entire globe, about 30% of the shortwave incoming radiation is reflected. Now, uh, the second panel on the right shows the uh, infrared radiation being emitted from the globe. And at equilibrium, this one equals this one, and the temperature of the Earth doesn't change. Now, again, the infrared has very large variations. There are areas which are emitting very strongly, 
And there are other areas, and these coincide with clouds, which have their tops in cold regions of the, of the atmosphere. Those are emitting very little infrared radiation. And just to play a bit of that movie, this is running through a year, the job of general circulation models is to try and simulate this kind of behavior and simulate this behavior and get it right to uh, much better than one watts per square meter. So you can see instantly this is a very, very difficult uh, challenge, a very, very hard computational job. So, well, you, our, our chairman asked how good are the models. I, I really think that question should be delayed for Stocker, who is coming later this year, who is uh, the new chair of the uh, co-chair of the IPCC. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's been invited, I think, in September, and he will be a great expert to address questions of that nature. Um, okay, so. What I'm going to show in the next few slides is some evidence for pre-industrial uh, associations of solar variations with climate variations. Now, because it's pre-industrial, these are clearly only natural contributions, okay? So any climate change before the 20th century has to have a natural origin. And the, the fact is that there are a, a lot of uh, these observations and they're growing. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a very controversial subject. Um, and it's controversial because there is no established physical mechanism that can link variations of the sun with uh, variations of the climate. And so not only is it controversial, of course, it cannot be included in any climate model. So all the variations I'm going to show you are just empirical observations and, and not explained. They're currently just questions uh, and cannot be explained by uh, current simulations. Okay, now the, the, the first, the most, the, the closest and the most uh, well-known observation of solar climate variability has to do with the so-called Little Ice Age uh, and its association with the sunspot record. Now, um, before I talk about that, let me tell you what a sunspot is. Here's a sunspot. A sunspot is, uh, th this is a sunspot. It's a region of very high electric field on the surface of the sun. Um, it, the, 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 sorry, electric field, magnetic field. This is a region of two and a half or so thousand gauss. Um, and the effect of that strong magnetic field, it's typically just a few gauss, the ambient electric field on the surface. I mean, the, the, the quiescent electric field. This very strong electric field pushes aside the plasma and inside the sunspot, it's slightly cooler, so it looks darker, but it's essentially the magnetic pressure that pu pushes it aside. And you can see actually these lines which correspond to magnetic field lines. Now, these, these things are huge. This is the size of the Earth in comparison. Now, as is well known, the sunspot cycle, these things appear with a quasi-periodicity of about 11 years on the surface of the sun and they go up and down. So these are the, this is the 11-year sunspot cycle. And it's an exquisite scientific record, which started in 1610. This was two years after the invention of the telescope by Lippershey in Holland. And shortly after it was discovered, a lot of astronomers started looking at the sun. And there was a period of essentially no sunspots, very, very few. And then they started to appear. This was not due to uh, lack of interest by the astronomers. There was very great interest. They, they were watching day by day. The sunspots did not appear. Now you can see, just looking at this record, that although the, the, there is this quasi-periodicity, there's a very great uh, amount of variability in the amplitude of the, sun, the sunspot cycle. And what you can't see so clearly, the periodicity changes. Its average is 11, but sometimes it's much longer. And it turns out, okay, so the, the the, the, the first association then of solar climate variability was that this period here corresponded, perhaps it was a coincidence or not, in fact it wasn't a coincidence, but uh, this period coincided with recorded very cold periods in, uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere, and in fact signals have been observed uh, over the entire globe of the Little Ice Age. And during this period, for example, uh, the, the Thames regularly froze over and fairs and so on were held on the ice. Um, this was a similarly cold period, and you can see that also in the, uh, in the sunspot record. So, now let, let's step back over the last thousand years. The Little Ice Age then is here. Let's look just at this, 
this plot first of all. This is rather, rather I'm afraid, a confusing set of overlapping curves. But the essential point is there was a cold period here. This is temperature, and this is time going back to year 1000. This is a, uh, the, the, the Little Ice Age. This is the warm period known as the medieval warm, medieval warm period. And there are many reconstructions which uh, agree or disagree depending, in fact, on whether they include tree rings or not. Tree rings are a very difficult proxy to use, but never mind. Um, generally, the, there is this uh, agreement that there was a cold period, there was a warm period. There's a huge debate as to whether the medieval warm period was colder than today, uh, similar, or some authors actually think it's warmer. It doesn't matter. It was a similarly warm period. This is the famous period that... Uh, the uh, Greenland was settled and uh, grape, grapes uh, and wine was made, made in Britain and so on. Um, now, even though we don't have temperatures over, uh, thermometers over this period, you can actually drill boreholes through the ice or through the ground even and very precisely measure the temperature and reconstruct because of the very slow diffusion time of uh, heat uh, through, through the ground you can actually reconstruct past temperatures with thermometers. And these confirm this uh, dip here and this warm period here. These are ice cores measuring the temperature and so on. Now, this little red line here is actually the thermometer record that you saw right at the beginning. This is the global warming. And seen in this context, at least part of the, uh, the warming over this period could be interpreted, at least qualitatively, as part of coming out of the Little Ice Age. Of course, the argument is that it's very steep over the last 30 years or so. So even if the early part has a, a natural component, it's accelerating now. But uh, anyway, it, it's interesting to step back and see it in a wider perspective. Now, the second transparency, second slide uh, panel down here, shows the variation of cosmic rays over the same period. It's inverted, so these are high cosmic rays, these are low cosmic rays similar to today, and you see this same general pattern. But more, more interestingly, there are quite a number of records, this is one of them and there are, there are many others, that show a detailed climatic reconstruction over this period. This happens to be uh, glaciers in the Andes, and this co corresponded to very advanced glaciers and very retreated glaciers. And you can see uh, visual correspondence between these two. This correspondence has been extended back in Central Europe over 2,000 years. This is temperatures in a cave. It's del the Delta O18, as it's called. It's a, a stable isotope of oxygen, which is sensitive to temperature. Uh, it, this is analyzed in water and carbonate deposits. This is the temperature reconstruction. This is the, the cosmic ray reconstruction. Carbon dioxide was essentially flat over this period. Now, I, I can't spend any time explaining how these various uh, things are reconstructed, but there is a, you have to accept that there is a, an exquisite uh, measurement of past cosmic rays from both carbon-14 and beryllium-10. Beryllium-10 is analyzed in ice cores. Carbon-14 is analyzed in tree rings. Those light radioactive radioisotopes are solely produced by cosmic rays. Uh, actually, the H-bomb produced a lot after the 1950s, but prior to the H-bomb, the only source was actually cosmic rays. So there are a beautiful record of past cosmic ray changes. So, let's see. Okay, so this is similarly, this is a, a new paper which is just being published now. Uh, in GRL uh, showing another reconstruction. This is temperature in the red curve. It's a, it's a central Siberian climate, so it's very continental climate. This is the variation of cosmic rays. Again, you see this very close association. This is a plus, this is a one degree C temperature change, quite a considerable temperature change in comparison with current warming. This is entirely a natural effect. We don't know what the origin of this is, as I keep stressing. And of course, there's a divergence here in the 20th century. Uh, part of this is carbon dioxide. Uh, perhaps all of it is carbon dioxide, but the authors say up to 50% could be, could be due to solar contribution. And that's rather a different uh, amount than the current understanding. Um, okay, so uh, now this is extending going back 10,000 years and uh, or 12,000 years and this is looking at something called ice rafted debris so uh, th this 
you recognize what this thing is. When this is a piece of ice, that, uh, when it's in a glacier, it grinds away at the rock and embeds in various uh, pieces of rock and so on. When that carves off and moves out into the North Atlantic, it melts the underneath of the, of the iceberg, rains down on the ocean, and uh, settles the sediment. And those sediments are drilled in a core from a ship, uh, carefully extracted, and by analyzing versus depth, these stones, one can reconstruct the intensity of icebergs in the North Atlantic. And uh, the black line in both these curves is identical. One goes a bit further earlier in time. It's, it's measuring the intensity of icebergs in the North Atlantic. This roughly corresponds to a two degree C temperature difference in the surface waters of the North Atlantic. And this corresponds to a lot of icebergs even south of the coast of Ireland. And this corresponds to very few icebergs. Okay, now the colored lines in both these are two independent reconstructions of cosmic rays over the same period. And you, you have to just look at by eye at the association of these two curves. And clearly, uh, it goes far beyond just a random association. There's clearly uh, a connection between the cosmic ray changes and the changes in these iceberg, these ice rafted debris. And the, the, the little ice age is this dip here, and the medieval warm period is that thing there. So that, that association we saw in a couple of slides earlier is something that's been repeated 10 times or so uh, over the last 2,000 years. The sun seems to go quite frequently into a very quiet state uh, of low activity and into a high activity state. Now, all those things I've shown you so far have to do with temperature reconstructions. I just want to show you a couple uh, to do with the hydrological cycle. It seems that there's an association also of cosmic rays or solar activity with the, uh, the, the hydrological cycle. Now, the, the ITCC, ITCZ is the intertropical convergence zone. It's the, uh, the convergence of the two Hadley cells that essentially follows the sun's zenith. So it's this region of very high, deep, highly convective clouds. And in the summer, it essentially, as I say, follows the sun's zenith. It goes north or it goes south. And it's a region of intense monsoon activity. Now, during the Little Ice Age, all these uh, boxes shown in, uh, with a yellow box uh, had drier conditions than normal. And all these uh, blue circles were wetter than normal. So there seems to have been a systematic global shift during the Little Ice Age of this uh, wet uh, band. Now, there's an exquisite record here of a cave in Oman. This is a stalagmite that was analyzed in Oman, and it was, it's been precisely dated by ura uranium thorium dating, which is a very, very precise technique uh, to, be, to have grown between six and a half and nine and a half thousand years ago. Oman's semi-arid today, but it was, uh, inside uh, a very wet uh, monsoon type precipitation over that period. And what you see here is two curves. One is reflecting the rainfall measured in that, um, that stalagmite. And the gray curve is measuring the variation of cosmic ray intensity measured from uh, California bristlecone pines and uh, various other uh, tree ring uh, analyses of carbon-14 production. And you can see the, the, the uh, essentially perfect co uh, correspondence between these two curves. So by some means, cosmic rays or solar variability, they're, they're ambiguous, were controlling very tightly uh, the variation of rainfall in this region. And there's a region here that, that was measured, there was higher growth and that expanded, uh, is expanded here. And again, you see that very close correlation. So, okay, I, I'm uh, proceeding rather quickly, I hope, uh, some of this is uh, sinking in, but basically what we have is a set of, uh, a set of observations uh, and the, I, I think uh, it doesn't serve any purpose to keep adding more. We, what we need now is to really understand what this mechanism is. And the fact is there are very, very few possible uh, candidate mechanisms. The, they're listed here. Essentially, there could be a direct effect of solar variability on the climate to do with the brightness of the sun or some spectral component of the sun, or there could be an indirect effect because the, uh, w the, the change in the magnetic activity of the sun directly influences the shielding, 
the, the uh, solar wind and the shielding of cosmic rays. So these are modulated by magnetic changes of the sun, and that would be called an indirect effect. Now, there, there are many studies of sun-like stars and estimations of what could be the change over this period of the solar irradiance. And one of them is shown here. This is Lien et al., which has recently been revised downwards very substantially. But anyway, this is the current understanding, uh, and it's been put through a climate model. And it, it's estimated that only a few hundredths of a degree of the temperature change between the Little Ice Age and today could have been due to changes in the brightness of the sun. So this is uh, much more than an order of magnitude less than the uh, reconstructed temperature change over this period. So it looks like at least the sun's brightness is not capable of explaining that. That doesn't rule it out. Maybe we just don't understand the sun. But uh, it would require a major change in our understanding of the sun if its brightness could change by a sufficient amount to have caused this, uh, this temperature shift. Now, how do we resolve this ambiguity? Because it always exists if it's solar modulation of the, of the cosmic rays. Well, there is a way. And that is that the cosmic rays are also modulated by other things, short-term magnetic disturbances, the geomagnetic field shields cosmic rays, and also on much longer timescales, the, the galactic environment. So let me show a couple of those. This has to do with the geomagnetic field. Now, th this is discussing the Asian monsoon. Now, the, the monsoon works in the following way. During the summer, uh, there's very intense insulation over the land that causes very deep convective clouds to build up that drags in uh, air from uh, very moist air from uh, a cooler ocean but very uh, uh, humid air uh, it rises up it, it rains down and that's the summer monsoon in the winter it reverses and in fact the winds are going from the, the land out to shore and then it's dry but the summer monsoon is caused by this kind of circulation so it's driven very much by the land sea temperature contrast now there's an exquisite record here which uh, was just published of an analysis of a K, uh, speleothem in china over the last 220,000 years this uh, speleothem has grown actually it's several speleothems which have been spliced together and they're shown in the colored line here and this line shows the variation in monsoon intensity in southeast asia this is increasing intensity going vertically up now, superposed on this, this, um, these uh, variations is a gray line which shows the so-called Milankovitch orbital variation of insulation. This is due the, the, um, on very long time scales, 20,000 years, 40,000 years, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is varying, both the angle of the Earth, the obliquity, and also the precession, it's spinning like a top. And this is changing the amount of insulation. It's not changing the amount of total energy reaching the Earth, but it's changing, changing the seasonal contrast, and the amount in any given, given part of the Earth is shifting by you know, 10, 20 percent. And you can see that, and this is an absolute prediction. There is no uh, latitude on the time scale here. This is an absolute prediction of the change in the insulation in this region. And you can see a perfect correspondence, or as, as perfect as any geo, geophysical. Uh, reconstruction can get uh, between this and these are very precisely dated things all right so we have a very clear information here that uh, insulation is really uh, uh, dictating the, the monsoon strength now I'm going to look just at that last little bit there and this is shown here the last 10,000 years unfortunately it's flipped so now the monsoon intensity is increasing going down this uh, is the monsoon intensity. It's actually from another cave. It's a red line. This is the insulation change. And there's a second curve here, the blue line, which is a reconstruction of the magnetic field over this same period with plus, or plus or minus two sigma errors. Now, if one takes away the smooth curve here and looks at the residuals, the residuals look here. And the authors who uh, prepared this paper uh, question whether this is evidence or not. Uh, for an association of the geomagnetic field with the Asian monsoon, at least over this 5,000-year period. I mean, I, I, I don't think one can be definitive. It's suggestive. Um, the sign is actually reversed, but for technical reasons, that, that may be understood. Okay, so this is the last transparency on this particular topic. But on a very, very long time scale, we're now looking at 500 million years, 
uh, which, I mean, the, the Earth's age is four and a half billion years. So this is uh, going 20% back to the beginning of the Earth. Um, the intensity of cosmic rays has gone through several large oscillations with a period of about 140 million years. Now, why is that? I mean, this is, the black line shows the variation or the estimated variation of cosmic rays. And this is today's intensity. This is two times, and this is zero times today's amplitude. Why does it do this? Well, it does this because the solar system is actually gradually orbiting uh, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is rotating, but the Earth is not exactly locked into the Milky Way rotation. It's actually orbiting round at a, a, a different uh, angular speed. And it takes about 550 million years to get one complete revolution, and it takes about 140 million years to go from one spiral arm to the next. Now, when Earth is inside a spiral arm, uh, it's actually exposed to a higher cosmic ray flux because the cosmic rays are emitted by supernovae and they're actually diffusively progressing through the, milk, through the spiral arms. The, the spiral arms have relatively strong uh, interstellar magnetic fields and so the, the, uh, the cosmic rays are essentially diffusively trapped in those and have a higher intensity and a lower intensity between the spiral arms. And that's the estimate as to what the change in, in intensity is. Now, the bottom curve here is a completely independent reconstruction by, this is by Visor, of temperature variations at the bottom of the ocean, deep creatures that uh, live at the bottom of the ocean are sensitive to temperature, and by analyzing the oxygen 18, this amplitude has been found, net change in the temperature of the bottom ocean. This is about four degrees C, which is actually very substantial for a bottom temperature change. And again, there's some indication of a similar periodicity and roughly the correct phase uh, with respect to cosmic rays. Now, there's another set of uh, paleoclimatic reconstructions that show that Earth has gone through very strong climate shift from so-called greenhouse to icehouse conditions. We're in an ice house condition, meaning there is ice at the South Pole, there is ice at the North Pole, this is an icy condition. There have been times in the past, several periods, where there was absolutely no ice on Earth, and where, or essentially none, and where tropical plants grew north of the Arctic Circle. And these are the so-called greenhouse conditions. So these oscillations are, are shown here, and they roughly correspond reasonably well with these independent reconstructions here. Now, the classical explanation of climate change on this long time period is actually due to very big changes in carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide, the reconstructions are shown here. We're at 400 ppm at the moment. In the past, it's been 10 times or even more uh, higher than its current level. And these are the reconstructions based on various uh, geochemical means and they don't show any periodicity. So there's no obvious correspondence between this, uh, these fluctuations and the carbon dioxide. So perhaps, uh, perhaps there's a very long-term galactic effect uh, on, uh, on the climate. So now I'm going to make a few comments on climate change, on solar variability in the 20th century. And again, there are no answers here. There are just observations. So this is a movie just to give you a feeling as to what the sunspot cycle looks like at the peak of the sunspot cycle. So this is, this is uh, the most active the sun is. This is at the, the most recent peak. These are sunspots. This is what you would view if you could look at the sun uh, with suitable filter. That's, that's what you see. And that's the, the, you could say the brightness change of the sun is qualitatively uh, reflected by that picture. Now I'm going to show you another view of the sun, but now with eyes that you can't see. This is viewed in the extreme ultraviolet. So this is now, this is 20 nanometers, and this is now sensitive to the corona. So this is the magnetic part of the sun, which is sensitive to, uh, which is creating the solar wind um, and creating the magnetic disturbances. And we're starting at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. So we're going to wind up to the 2001 and you'll see the gradual change, which is much more impress uh, impressive uh, in terms of its magnetic transformation uh, than the, the visual change. And it's this 
what you see here, these loops are magnetic loops on the surface of the sun uh, which trap plasma. The plasma is radiating and you're seeing, and therefore they're illuminating. And these, these are, you can see the magnetic structures here. Uh, when these magnetic field lines recombine, it, the magnetic energy is dissipated and it ejects uh, great quantities of uh, plasma which go out and help shield. Uh, and you can, see, you can even see the, the detector itself, that snow was due to extra radiation hitting the CCD or whatever that's viewing the, uh, viewing the sun. So you can see the sun has two characteristics. One is its, uh, its uh, brightness, it's uh, the orange color that you're looking at. And the other character, it's a Jekyll and Hyde character, the other is this magnetic activity, which is manic. I mean, it's changing very strongly over the solar cycle and it's changing on, um, uh, sec on a, on a long-term time scale as well. There's, there's direct evidence for that from the cosmic ray changes. All right. Um, so what are the cosmic ray changes in the 20th century? Well, the answer is that there were there was a very large change of cosmic ray flux in the 20th century. The solar magnetic flux, the magnetic activity, increased by about a factor 2.3, but it was largely confined to the first half of the century. In the second, and that caused a 20% decrease in cosmic rays. So if cosmic rays are affecting clouds, as we're going to get onto in a moment, um, that would have caused, in principle, a decrease uh, if this, uh, of, of clouds, at least over the first half. Now, in the second half of the century, we've had direct measurements from counters. There are several uh, long-term measurements of cosmic rays. This is some very beautiful data from uh, Lebedev in Moscow, where balloons were flown over this entire period at various locations. And what you see, this is the solar cycle variation. When the sun is uh, at a high of a sunspot cycle, it causes a dip. It increases the shielding of cosmic rays and causes a dip in the cosmic ray intensity reaching Earth. And it's more important at higher geomagnetic latitudes. So the, 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 the systematic changes of cosmic rays were only in the first half of the century. There was nothing to speak of in the second half other than the 11-year cycle. Now, again, I, I'm going to show just a, a couple of observations where there seem to be some, there's something very interesting going on with the sun. And I repeat, uh, I don't have the answers. These are simply questions and observations. So we hear a lot about the sea level change in the 20th century. So let me show you what that is. This is the reconstruction. This is a, a recent one by Holgate in GRL from 1900 to 2000. And this is the rise in sea level that's been reconstructed it's 17 centimeters over the century, 1.7 millimeters per year, and it's fairly constant. So it's very interesting, this plot. I mean, the first thing that's very interesting is, why is it so steady? I mean, there's no sign of it going up more steeply over this period. Now, so it really doesn't reflect the temperature increase now, uh, at all well. Now, what's the cause of this? Well, there, there are two main contributions. One is the thermal expansion of the oceans, and the other is land ice melting. And I mean, there, there are many estimates. Uh, if you just estimate what the temperature change would have done for the well-mixed top 100 meters of the, of the ocean, the answer is less than a centimeter or so. So it, if, if this is expansion, as it, it has to be a big component of that, it means that much more of the ocean is somehow getting connected to get warming up. But even, even when direct measurements have been made deeper down, I, I don't think it's explaining very well most of this expansion. But anyway, the fact is that it, it's uh, largely a continuous rise and there's no evidence of an acceleration here uh, which would be following essentially the global temperatures. Now the second observation that's very interesting is that it isn't exactly flat all the way. There are periods when it went almost constant and then even went negative and then went positive again. So if one looks at those variations by differentiating that, you get this curve here. So here's the 1.7 average, 1.7 millimeters per year. Sometimes it's almost double that, and sometimes it's almost zero. But it seems to be fluctuating like this. It's also interesting that the, the, this reconstruction was done over this period by uh, nine by a lot of stations and over this period by only a few stations but of high quality and the data have to be very carefully corrected for 
isostatic rebound, that's the rebound of the ground. When the ice sheets are melted, the earth is still, in the northern hemisphere, is still uh, recovering from the weight of the ice. And so one has to correct for that. One has to correct for other tectonic movement and so on. That's all being done in these data. We also now have st satellite measurements, which amazingly enough can measure one millimeter, sub-millimeter changes of the level uh, in the ocean by very precise telemetry. And they agree with these ground measurements. So that's the variation. And I've just overlaid here simply the sunspot cycle, OK, on that uh, over that interval. And well, you can judge for yourself whether this is a completely random coincidence. It clearly is not very good in this region. It looks quite impressive here, and it looks bad here. Incidentally, there was a very strong El Nino here, which has a big effect on sea level. So that would, uh, 97, 98, so that would definitely swing the data towards the right. So th there's a very, very suggestive but, uh, uh, association there that these, these things may be associated with the sun. It's very interesting that this paper, there isn't a single mention anywhere in that paper of the sun. And it, to me, it's absolutely incredible that he can publish, that this data can be published, and at least no comment, to, you know, to, even to rule it out should be mentioned, uh, but something should be said because it's, uh, it seems so obvious. Now, <laughs> there's another reason why the sea level can rise, so that's, uh, that's shown here. And uh, when, when I saw this joke, I instantly, of course, had to uh, estimate what would happen if all five billion people on Earth were similarly endowed as these people, and they all jumped in the ocean at the same time. <laughs> and the answer, not surprisingly, is uh, it would only be very small. It's about a micron that the, uh, <laughs> that the ocean would rise. So I think we can... <laughs> so the one answer I can give you, we can, we can safely rule this, house, this out as a contribution to the sea level rise. Okay, now, the, the situation of the last 30 years is very, very interesting, and to me, raises a lot of questions. Um, it's shown here the temperature rise of the last 30 years. Now, over the last 30 years, we've not only had the thermometers, which is shown by these red, red things here, but we've also had uh, microwave measurements from satellites, and that's shown here. And we've also had radio sonde measurements from balloons. And the structure is very, in very good agreement, but there is, they're both normalized to be the same at this point, and the satellite measurements are systematically measuring less warming than the surface temperature measurements. Um, so th this, is a, this is just an open question. It's a, an unsolved problem, I'd say, in, in, uh, in the climate world. The, a lot of the variance, uh, like this here, was in El Nino. A lot of the variance here, in fact, all, almost all the variance is due to, uh, is due to El Nino, southern, southern oscillation. Uh, and that has a very big effect on global temperatures. Uh, there are also some dips like this one due to volcanoes. Now, not only is there a disagreement here between, in the absolute rise over this period, but there's also a very important disagreement, perhaps even more importantly, uh, in the distribution of the warming. This is what all climate models show. Uh, this is uh, latitude, this is the equator, and this is height in the atmosphere. All climate models show that the warming is faster in the upper troposphere. This is essentially the greenhouse effect at, at work. Whereas the satellite measurements show, well, they agree that the, the pole, the, the North Pole has been, polar region has been warming rapidly, but they don't at all show this warming pattern in the, in the atmosphere. So not only is it low, but it should be higher. There's a real discrepancy here, and it's an unsolved problem. It's just not, not answered yet. Now, let's look at the last eight years. The last eight years, the temperatures, both sets of data agree that the temperatures are flat. But the CO2 is definitely increasing. It's increased substantially over this period. So this must be uh, some kind of natural forcing that's going on here. So what is the natural forcing? Um, well, we don't know is the answer. Um, but I'm going to show two, two things that could be contributors. OK, the, the first one has nothing directly to do with the sun, but I think it has to be mentioned. This is the El Nino pattern. When El Nino happens, there's a very warm tongue of water that occurs over the, uh, the, e the, western, sorry, the eastern Pacific of uh, Peru and so on. 
Okay, now there's an, another oscillation that happens on a much longer time scale that has a very similar pattern, and it's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It was only discovered 10 years ago uh, by uh, at the University of Washington, but it has a very similar pattern. Now, the differences are that they, they, they have similar amplitudes, they, but the important difference is in the timing. El Nino typically lasts about one year, and it fluctuates from uh, uh, an El Nino to a La Nina, the opposite effect. The, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation has a much longer periodicity. It's a 30-year periodicity, and it went through several phase changes. It was positive here during a warming period of the climate. It was negative here during a cooling period. It was positive here during a warming period. And you know, we don't know yet, but it may have switched into a negative. Now, this coincidence could be a coincidence, but in as much as, uh, in as much as we know this has a big effect on global climates, the question is, what effect does the PDO have on global temperatures? We don't know. Now, now I'm going to show you something finally to do with the sun. I have to keep my eye on the clock. The sunspots, sunspot weakening. There was a very, very interesting paper which I only saw a year ago. Uh, in fact, nobody saw it apart from the authors and a few referees until a year ago because it was turned down for publication. And this is a beautiful, beautiful experimental method. I, I, I have no idea why the referees turned this down. It, it must have offended their sense of scientific orthodoxy. But let me show you what it is. On three different counts, these experimenters uh, measured a weakening of sunspots. This is some of their data. Th this is comparing 1991 with 2002. They found a weakening of the temperature sensitive OH line inside sunspots. And this is the Zeeman splitting of an iron, a neutral iron line. Here you can see the splitting is wider in the blue line, the blue curve, and narrower in the red curve. In other words, the magnetic field surrounding in the umbra has gone, d has gone down over this period. And that's shown in this curve here for all the sunspots they measured. And this is shown here. They, they measured also the, sun, the sunspot contrast. When they extrapolate all three data that I don't show you the OH, all three data sets, it says if you get to 2015, the sunspots may have totally disappeared. And that was their conclusion. Uh, and they were turned down for that publication. OK. Now, what's the reality today? We're now five years or four years beyond their publication. We're here. We're here. This is the sun's irradiance. It's the, it's the lowest it's ever been uh, since records started 30 years ago. The cosmic rays are the highest they've ever been. Not only that, the period of this last cycle is now 13.1 years at least. If you look at this complete sunspot record, actually back to 1750, the last time, there's only one sunspot cycle that has a longer period than 13.1 years, and it's here just before the Dalton minimum started. So we have a lot of information that's all saying the sun's activity is going very, very low at the moment, and we don't understand, nobody understands what it is. But there's a final comment here that we are living in very interesting times for the sun, and this uh, is supposed to be a Chinese curse. I hope it's uh, a blessing, not a curse. So let's move on to, we, so we've got all this, information, some of it qualitative, some of it quantitative, that the sun is somehow affecting the climate. So the, the real question, and in fact, the key to this whole problem is what's the, the physical mechanism? Uh, if we're just left with correlations, we can never handle them. We have to understand the physics of what's going on. So what are the possible physical mechanisms? And it would have to be, if it's a cosmic ray effect, it would have to be a cosmic ray effect on, the, uh, on clouds, some fashion on the clouds. So, let me uh, tell you uh, why aerosols are important for clouds. Every cloud droplet has a seed inside called the cloud condensation nuclei, nucleus. When you increase the number of uh, CCN inside a cloud, you increase and keep this, the water content brighter. In other words, spread the water over more droplets, it bright, its brightness increases. So it becomes a more reflective cloud. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that it actually rains out more slowly. Clouds rain out because droplets start to condense, uh, co coalesce when they get big enough by gravitation and then they drop out. If you spread that out over more droplets, the cloud will stay longer. Now, 
there are very, there's plenty of evidence that large regions of the climate are lacking sufficient aerosol to form clouds. Contrails are a, a well-known example of that. These are not smoke trails. These are clouds which are seeded by jets dumping aerosols into the upper atmosphere. Uh, also, less familiar, but also very important, these are ship tracks. And this is a huge area. This is the north coast of America. There's Alaska. These are ship tracks over Alaska. And they're, they're clouds being seeded by, by uh, extra aerosol. Now, in particle physics, we do know that charged particles can form condensation seeds. But we have to say instantly that this is a non-natural condition. This is where we generate several hundred percent supersaturation of vapor or liquid, and uh, then bubbles will form or, or droplets will form. And in the atmosphere, the supersaturations in a cloud are a few tenths of a percent above 100%. So these are very different conditions. So the question is, under natural conditions, can cosmic rays do this? And the answer is, they possibly can. There are, there's a, a, a mechanism known as, well, okay, an important source of these seeds for cloud droplets is so-called gas to particle conversion, where a gas condenses onto an embryonic cluster and then grows from the embryonic size past a critical size up to uh, 100 nanometers or so, where it can become a seed for a cloud droplet. Now, it turns out that until you exceed, the, there's a critical size below which this embryonic cluster is more likely to evaporate than grow. If you add a single charged particle to that, then the energy diagram looks like this, and it will spontaneously grow. On the other hand, uh, the availability of ions is, is dictated by cosmic rays, so this whole path is dictated by the supply of cosmic rays and also trace gases. Now, is this an important process uh, globally? Various models have been done, and some people say no, and some people say yes. Um, this is one of the yes plots, not surprisingly, not one of the no plots. Um, and this shows the ratio of uh, ion-induced nucleation to all other nucleation of creation of aerosol in the atmosphere. Anything above blue means that um, uh, ion-induced nucleation dominates. So according to these people, uh, it's very important, except where Sahara dust and so on is important. Does it exist in the atmosphere? Some studies say it's at the level of 10 or 20% is ion-induced nucleation. Some studies say it's bigger than that. Um, it's also likely that it's much more important over oceans where uh, there are lower background aerosol which steal the trace gases and uh, also at higher altitude where the temperatures are smaller. But quite simply, the, the measurements don't exist. And also, quite simply, I think all these studies are subject to very large uncertainties on the experimental parameters. We essentially need the basic physics to be measured first before we can trust, I think, those results. Um, this shows that uh, this is a, an actual direct measurement of uh, a very energetic so-called solar cosmic ray event, which dumped a lot of radiation in this region of the atmosphere uh, on a particular date. Um, and the, using satellites, the aerosols were measured in this region. And although I can't explain it, this is uh, an increase of the aerosols over two days after the event occurred. And this delay is typical of when these uh, there have been many other observations of this nature from ground-based LIDAR measurements and so on, which also show uh, increased aerosol production at high altitudes due to high uh, deposition of ionization. Uh, the cloud observations uh, are controversial. There are many papers. That, so this is, do, do direct observations of clouds and changes of cosmic rays, namely over the solar cycle, do they show a correlation? There was the original observation made about 10 years ago that essentially relaunched this whole subject. And uh, I think the answer is uh, absolutely not clear, not conclusive yet. Um, some studies say that there's no effect. Some studies say that there is an effect. Uh, if there's an effect, my own personal feeling is that if there's an effect, it's much more likely to be restricted to certain regions of the atmosphere and not all clouds at all times, um, and, um, and also certain altitudes. One example of uh, one study, which is shown here, I, I'm afraid it's, I, it, it, the, the patches essentially are regions where there's some 
90% significance of the correlation of the two solar cycles with clouds. And this is maybe the best region, so this is the best looking region. Uh, this is the low cloud variation. This is the cosmic ray variation uh, that obviously shows a correlation because it's pre-selected to be the region uh, where one was found. Okay. So it's inconclusive, I'd say, that, and we just need more data on the clouds. But I, I have to say that all these studies which say yes, there is an effect or no, there isn't effect, to me, they're completely not independent because they're all essentially using the same satellite cloud data set and interpreting it in different ways. Now, uh, okay, there's a, I've focused very much on the main, the, a priori the main way that mechanism that cosmic rays may be affecting the climate to do with the effect on aerosol. There's actually a complete other aspect under which they could be affecting clouds and it has to do with the global electrical circuit. Um, I'm going to, I'm afraid, have to go very quickly over that but uh, I, I want, for completeness, I want to mention it. This is the, uh, the, the, the Earth. The Earth has a, an ionosphere at 250 kilovolts. It's generated, it's continually charged up by lightning uh, in tropical regions. That keeps it at that charge, uh, that voltage. And then there's a fair weather current that's continually drifting down to ground of about uh, two to four picoans per square meter. When that current is intercepted by clouds, clouds, you get space charge building up at the bottom and top of the cloud. And then these high space charge regions uh, will charge up droplets and uh, they get entrained inside clouds and may affect, uh, may get accreted inside the cloud, uh, entrained and affect the cloud microphysics. Um, it's, a, it's a complete different area. It's part of what we want to study with cloud. So now we get into cloud. Uh, finally, in the last uh, few minutes of the talk. This is the cloud collaboration. It's uh, 19 institutes. It's an interdisciplinary collaboration, predominantly of aerosol cloud experts. And we're also very happy to have uh, a group of 10 enthusiastic young people who are all doing their PhDs and, and so on, going to do, get all the physics out of this experiment. Now, just to put cloud in the context of the whole suite of studies, Cloud is not a, cloud is complementary to existing studies in the atmosphere. And uh, at the largest scale, there are set satellites measuring large cloud systems. There are many ground and aircraft experiments measuring on a cloud scale. And uh, cloud is measuring on this scale. When I did this, I was very pleased to see how a small experiment like cloud could end up with a very big bar next to all these satellite and uh, and uh, aircraft experiments. So what's our method? Our method is to build a chamber uh, and to attach to it state-of-the-art analyzing instruments and to put it in a CERN PS beam line, which provides an artificial controllable uh, source of cosmic rays. And then we ha want to carry out a, a series of laboratory experiments under very precisely controlled conditions, temperature, trace gases, aerosols, ions, and so on. And we want to study aerosol nucleation and growth and cloud droplet uh, and ice particle microphysics and see the difference with and without the beam. Now, we had a pilot run uh, in 2006, shortly after being approved, using a two meter chamber, which is shown here. And this is a schematic of the chamber. Essentially, the, the chamber was filled with um, uh, ultra pure air from a cryogenic liquids, uh, we added trace gases, we sampled small amounts of gas and put them through sensitive instruments and there was an electric field in the chamber and it was exposed to a beam. The purpose of this run was to get technical input for the cloud design and uh, to start to try the first physics measurements. I mean, I for one had absolutely no idea how these experiments worked. So it was a huge, hugely, for me personally, important run to understand exactly what the technical challenges were so that when we designed the real cloud, we could get the design right. Anyway, um, during the course of the experiment, we created uh, what, what are called a lot of aerosol bursts or banana plots. This is an aerosol, a, a banana plot or an aerosol burst observed by one of our collaborators uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, incidentally, this, this plot I don't know whether it was this one in particular, but this was worth the paper in science uh, 
just this observation itself. This was almost unknown. At, it was unknown at that stage. So the whole subject is very, very new. Even the non-ion part of it is very new. Okay, so this, what this is showing is a particular uh, day from zero to 24 hours. Uh, and this is the size distribution of aerosols. And just before midday, uh, a burst of new particles formed. Uh, red is an intense burst and grew to CCN sizes over a space of uh, five or six hours or so. And uh, what, what's always found in these bursts is that they're associated with a buildup of sulfuric acid vapor. So red is the sulfuric acid, green is a burst of these particles. This is the number concentration per cubic centimeter. But notice that the concentrations of sulfuric acid are right at the limit of detectability. This is 0.1 part per trillion by volume. So these are experimentally extremely difficult concentrations to control properly. Now this is uh, Cloud06 data. This is a banana plot. These are actually charged particles. Uh, these are one nanometer particles growing here. So we managed, we, we were generating routinely these aerosol bursts. And it's on the basis of this that one extracts the physics from the experiment. Now I have to say that these are not understood what, exactly what's causing this in the atmosphere. Sulfuric acid is definitely implicated, but it's not enough to cause this. So it's thought that extra vapors may be involved, organics and so on. Uh, and the, the role of ion-induced nucleation is also not at all understood from the atmospheric measurements. Um, okay, so this uh, shows maybe our best example from this Cloud06 run, of, uh, which is showing the following. This is time again uh, running in the horizontal axis. This is the beam intensity no beam, turn the beam on, off, on at a higher level, off, and so on. And this is measuring, if we just look at the pink and uh, cyan curve here, this is measuring the number of particles, uh, aerosol particles in the chamber above three nanometer size. Now, the, this aerosol burst started before we turned the beam on, so it definitely was a neutral nucleation event. But what, what I'd like to draw your attention to is that when the beam is on, there seems to be a gradient change. When the beam is off, there's a gradient change down, on, off, and then uh, it breaks apart here. Um, now, if we take that data, it's actually shown here, and we take other data when the chamber, towards the end of the cycle, when the chamber was clean, and plot the, the nucleation rate, the rate of production of fresh particles versus beam intensity, we essentially don't see any, any correlation. There is actually this weak correlation here, which is this data here, but the rest of the data shows no real correlation. There is a correlation with the intensity of sulfur dioxide ex expected, but certainly these points are just scattered around. We simply did not control the uh, impurities in the chamber well enough to extract physics from this experiment. But nevertheless, uh, there are suggestive associations here. And uh, as I said earlier, it's provided extremely important technical input, input for the cloud design, and it's taught us the importance of the cleanliness inside the chamber and other things. Now, I'm running out of time, and I have two transparency. No, I think, I, I think this is the last but one transparency. So what are these technical lessons uh, that have gone into the, uh, the, the cloud design? First of all, we, we, we need a large chamber. The diffusion lifetime, uh, whenever thing, the problem with a laboratory experiment is we get losses to the walls. And when uh, an aerosol or a ga trace gas particle hits the walls of the chamber, it sticks. Uh, or most of them stick. Uh, I mean, the, the things that interest us stick. Um, so we have to have a very big chamber to get the walls away. Uh, and that goes as the square of the dimension. And the dilution lifetime, due to the makeup gases that continually, we're sampling continually from the chamber, we have to make up those gases with fresh gas. Uh, it's an L cubed effect. So we, we, we're going to a three meter chamber. We need ultra clean conditions. So we, we generate ultra pure air from cryogenic liquids. Um, we are, we're following CERN ultra high va UHV procedures for all inner surfaces and we have no plastics. I've been very clear, to clean, <laughs> careful to say this is not an, a UHV vessel. It is not that clean, but we're following all the procedures and being very, very precise about uh, preparation of the surface and uh, electropolishing and so on. Temperature stability is very important. We need 0.1 stability. We have a fiber optic system uh, which has no heat load on the chamber. We're operating the chamber over the full stratospheric temperature range. We have a field cage 
with a special requirement of the field cage that's not like TPC field cages. TPCs are always operating with their field on. They don't care about a little bit of charge buildup on some insulators. Um, when we turn the field off, we have to absolutely guarantee there is no residual field. So all our insulators are actually partially conducting insulators. And it's been very, very difficult actually uh, getting that requirement in. Wide beam for the particles and the style of the experiment, even though it's a, an experiment in atmospheric physics, it's being run just like a particle physics experiment. We're essentially building a general purpose detector with, which will measure everything about the event. And we have a lot of very sophisticated state-of-the-art equipment that we're attaching to this, this chamber that will analyze what's going on inside. Uh, there's the chamber itself. Uh, these are the ports for sampling. These are the uh, individual feed-throughs for the fibers. This is a typical Portuguese physicist. I was careful not to have a typical Finnish, Finnish physicist there. The scale of the chamber would shrink a bit. So, but um, what are our plans? Um, so during the remainder of this year, we, we're building up the, the experiment. We hope to commission it by the end of the year and begin our first measurement. Certainly, we want to carry out a, te a complete technical evaluation of the chamber, and I hope that we get into the physics measurements as well. And uh, the first, we, we're essentially going after the same thing as we went after in 2006, but with, uh, with a much improved uh, device. In the winter shutdown in 2010, we're going to add the external thermal system. We have a temp temporary thermal system here, and we're going to extend the studies to include the addition of organics to this, which seem to be very important. And we'll look at the temperature dependence. And then in future years, we're going to extend to droplets and ice particles. What I didn't tell you is uh, we can actually operate this chamber in a cloud chamber mode. It, we can overpressure it to 200 millibar, do a very fast expansion in uh, five seconds, and create uh, ice particles and droplets inside the chamber and view them and sample them. So it's a, it's a pseudo cloud chamber. I mean, I call it pseudo, that's a, a derogatory term. It's a real cloud chamber. We will generate clouds and look at cloud and ice particle microphysics inside the chamber. Finally, um, so uh, what are the main points? The, the main points are that climate has continually varied in the past uh, and the causes on the 100-year timescale are not at all well understood. And they're very relevant for today's climate change. There's very strong evidence for solar climate variability, but there's no established mechanism. And uh, it's not the only candidate, uh, but cosmic ray influence on clouds is a leading uh, candidate uh, for, for, for that mechanism. What we hope to do with cloud at CERN is really to study and quantify uh, exactly what the cosmic ray uh, cloud mechanism is in, in a very controlled environment. And who knows, we may find at the end of our study that it's just, it has a negligible effect. And I, or, or alternatively, we may find it's very important. Whatever it is, I think the only way to settle this debate is really to settle it with more experimental data uh, rather than more passionate, uh, passionate opinions, which uh, is a popular way of uh, addressing some of these questions. And then finally, I think the, the question of whether and to what extent the, uh, the climate is influenced by solar or cosmic ray variability really re remains central to our understanding of climate, anthropogenic climate change. And until we answer this question, I think there will always be uh, a very large uncertainty in what the projections are uh, for what's going to happen this century. So it's a very, very important question to settle. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank Thank you all and thank my colleagues on cloud for uh, a very enjoyable experiment. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? So I went too fast. Everybody's... Uh, oh, well, at least there's one. <laughs> I have a question related to the analysis of the data. Uh, what's uh, new uh, in respect uh, with the analysis of the f frequencies of uh, the um, quantitative, I mean quantitative analysis of periodicity 
uh, and of correlations, of course, because uh, what you demonstrated, it was just some proposition, uh, but not correlation. The, in the climate record, you say? Okay, so the, the question has to do with what, what's the spectral or the frequency analysis of these climate correlations. Um, if you do a spectral, the, there, are, there are some periodicities in the solar signal. There's the well-known 11-year cycle. There's also a Gleisberg cycle, which is about 88 years and so on. But I think there's a real difference between the, so the Milankovic cycles, which are extremely precise and extremely well-defined and extremely phase con perfectly phase-controlled over a long period, and the sun. The sun is not, uh, is not an oscillator with such precise frequencies. So one can see indications, but I, I don't think there's any... Uh, model or any understanding that the sun should internally in its magnetic characteristics have precise frequencies. Those are only things that uh, pertain to planetary orbits and so on. Now, there is, there is actually a very interesting proposal. Uh, some authors believe that um, these, uh, these variations in, that have been seen are driven by uh, the orbits of the, the wobbles of the sun as Jupiter and Saturn and the main planets uh, are and Venus sorry not Venus Neptune uh, are orbiting the sun and the, the 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 sun does not is not of course sitting in the center of the of the solar system it's actually rotating about the cent the combined central mass of the solar system and that has uh, periods where it has uh, uh, well-defined shapes and periods where it has uh, uh, totally different shapes. And those seem to be connected with uh, variations of uh, solar activity. Uh, I don't know whether this, is, uh, whether this will hold up, but this is, this is what seems to be, this is what's been shown over the last thousand years. But apart from that, I know of no periodicities, true long-term periodicities in the uh, solar magnetic activity. Well, I have a question on my own. Perhaps uh, it shows my ignorance, but to actually have this generate this record of cosmic rays uh, in geological periods, which, which isotopes uh, do they observe? Um, you, you mean the Shafiv, the Weiser and Shafiv, 500 million year record? This th this is done by uh, Sh Shafiv looked at uh, the irradiation of meteorites, and by some means managed to extract. Uh, in, a, in an independent way, his calculations as to what was the, uh, the frequency of passage through the spiral arms. I think the experimental data, I mean, I have no way of judging w whether, whether his calculations were right, but the experimental data looked uh, very, I wouldn't say cast iron, it was qualitative in a way. So. Uh, I'm really not the person to ask how well it's calculated, but I have asked uh, several astrophysicists, and they actually say it's right, so I, I have confidence. I, I don't, but it's not my opinion, I, I don't know. Um, can't give a firm answer than that, I'm afraid. Any more questions or comments? Well, if not, let's thank uh, Jasper for a very nice talk. about the, the fluxes of cosmic rays uh, you know, over a long, long period of time. Yeah. So this is computer measure. I mean, normally, you, you look at carbon 14, for example. You can't do that. Um, yeah, 